Dennis Kelly the second. What was your favorite game, event, or general memory from this season, other than my questions? Well, there, it was just your questions, Dennis. That's it. That's all. Now I'll tell you. Here's what it was. Uh, we play in Winnipeg late December, and go to Minnesota for the New Year's Eve game against the Wild. So we get into Minnesota, and I wake up on a uh, an off day, or well, no no game anyway, practice day. And I wake up, and I actually slept in a little bit that day, and I look on my phone, and I've got three messages from three different people. Uh, one of them a guy I coach with during the baseball season. I forget who. I remember two of the three. One was him. The other one I remember was Mike Harrington from the Buffalo News. And I can't remember who the third one was. But anyway, I, I get the I wake up and I get these messages about me being on Sports Center. I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, they had been using my goal calls from the uh Winnipeg game because as you remember quite well, going into Minnesota, the Blue Jackets had won fourteen in a row, the Wild had won twelve in a row. So even the fine folks at ESPN were pumping it up about it being a big game on New Year's Eve. So that's just the start of when you're saying your favorite situation or your favorite game. That was my favorite game. And that started the situation, waking up and seeing those texts and trying to figure out what the heck these people were talking about because I was sleeping. And then going and calling that game and having the atmosphere be so intense and then watching the Blue Jackets just open it up and bury that team. That was my favorite game. That Minnesota game in Minnesota was my favorite game of the year. Not the 7-1 to one thrashing of the Penguins. It was that game because that was a character test game, and they passed the test. For that day, they passed the test. And I really think that that did a lot for them as a team. Just gave them, gave them belief and allowed them to, to keep on driving and then finally amass the number of points that they did. So that was my favorite game, Dennis. But your questions were so much better than that game. I can't even, you know, I can't put it into words how good your questions were, so I won't talk about them at all. DP3 says, hope there are frequent podcasts during the offseason. Think we'll lose any of our coaching staff, either hired by another team or fired. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I you know, Somebody could be hired by another team, I guess, but I think it'll stay intact. I don't think, I, don't, I certainly don't. Don't see anybody being fired. Although, heck, I, I don't know. I'm not the GM, and I'm not the head coach either. I play those roles on the radio, though, just so you know. Brad Birchfield checks in, says, The Penguins got us. That's sports. Great season. We'll be back. Appreciate what Aaron Portsline and Bobby Mack Sports do for the fans. They are great. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate that. And Brad is pretty great himself. He's a two-time back-to-back state championship football coach over at Bishop Hartley. Uh, know him well he's uh he's a class act and he is a huge blue jackets fan huge we talk about it all the time i drop my son off for school and if i see him i better have a, an extra 30 minutes because we're going to talk hockey no football all hockey so thanks brad i really appreciate that and and of course good luck to you going into the summer and trying to make it a three-peat now that's tough that's tough Craig Savage says, what was Sergei Bobrovsky doing or not doing this postseason that caused him to struggle so much? Was it confidence, technique, et cetera? I don't know, Corey. I don't know. He he just looked unsure of himself. From afar, he looked unsure of himself. I think his confidence was rattled. I think some of the goals the Penguins got, especially early in the series, really had him guessing. They were operating from behind the net. They were throwing uh, – cross rink passes and just trying to get tips instead of putting the puck on net. I, I think he really saw something he really hadn't seen much all year, and it shook him. Uh, his technique was the same. Uh, his work habits were the same. I, I think he just got – I think he got caught in a situation where they did enough things to where he started to question what he had to do to attack or, I guess more appropriately, to defend. And the minute you start thinking, you're done. Really. I mean, you think to an extent, but goaltending is read and react. And that's why you go through the drills so many times. And that's why Sergey stands out there by himself in a net before practice with nobody else on the ice, starting back on the goal line and shooting out to the top of the crease and stopping. 
and then shuffling to the right and stopping and dropping down in the butterfly, popping up and shuffling to the left and stopping and dropping to the butterfly and getting all the little robotic things that he does. He does for a reason. You practice those techniques so that in a game you don't have to think, you just react. Don't think, just do. And I, it's my opinion that he got caught thinking a lot in this series and not just reacting. And and that was his undoing. And, I, you know, again, the way the Penguins played made him think. Give, give them credit. They had a good game plan against him. That was very obvious. They had a good game plan against him. They saw that it worked early, and then they just kept ratcheting it up. And they lost one game along the way, but to them, it was no big deal. They had three games to give, so they lost one. Um. But I think they, I think they got into his head. I really do. That, and again, that's from sitting in the press box and watching him on the ice. He might fully debate me and say that I'm out of my mind, not even close to being right. But that's what it appeared to be. They made him think, not just react. And when you can do that to a goaltender, you have the advantage. Random CBJ fan says, "Can you foresee the NHL admitting that it's a mistake?" And going back to a one versus eight, two versus seven, three versus six, four versus five playoff format sometime soon. Clearly the support is there across the league. Is it? The support is there where across the league? The support is there with the fans? I'm sure it's there with the fans, no doubt about it. I don't think it's there amongst the ownership necessarily. I don't know if it's there amongst the general managers necessarily. And I w- if I were if I were running the league or if I had a big say as to what was going on in the league, I would probably say this year was a fluke to have the Capitals and the Penguins and the Blue Jackets be three of the top four in the entire league. Um, Because is that going to happen every year? No, it's not. And, again, this is another situation. If I sit here and say, oh, it should have been three against six and the Blue Jackets would have had a better chance, what do you sound like? You sound like... A sore loser. If they're trying to really get rivalries going, which is why they say they have this playoff format, why wouldn't you put Columbus and Pittsburgh together like we just saw? Would it be better if it was in the conference final? Okay, yeah, you can make that argument. But is is it better to have it in the first round or not to have it at all? Just take away, step back, and don't think about your team winning and advancing. Think from a business strategy in an overall picture. Is it better to have the Blue Jackets and the Penguins have a fierce playoff series in the first round or never to meet at all? It's probably better to have it one way or the other. And here's a fact. The Nashville Predators got put against the Chicago Blackhawks. They came out, and from the get-go they said, as a group, We're going to have to beat them at some point. Why not just do it now? And that's what they did. And the same is true with the Pittsburgh Penguins and the Washington Capitals. If you were going to get to the Stanley Cup final, you would more than likely have to beat both of those teams anyway. So does it matter if you get them in the first round or in the third round? Not really. You're going to get them anyway. The New York Rangers are the smartest team in the division. They're the absolute smartest and we talked about this and, you know, should you finish in the wild card spot and cross over to the Atlantic? And I said that Carey Price was going to be tough to beat in Montreal. There were no guarantees, and that's true. But the Rangers made a decision to where they were going to lock into that spot. I don't care what you say. They That was a conscious decision. They looked at it and they said, we can avoid Pittsburgh and Washington until the conference final. And then we only have to deal with one of them, not both of them. When Henrik Lundqvist was hurt, remember when he was out for three weeks? Do you think he would have been out for three weeks if they were challenging for the top spot in the division? Probably not. Top spot in the conference? Probably not. But, hey, you know what? Henrik, take your time. Take your time. Get back when you can get back. Let's let's give you another week. They locked into that spot. They lead their series three games to two. So they were smart in what they did. They're finding a way against Carey Price. And it would have been fun to go to Montreal and have that. But, again, let's let's think about this. Do you want a rivalry with the Pittsburgh Penguins or the Montreal Canadiens? You're in the Penguins division. They're three hours away. 
Don't you want that rivalry? It's never going to be a true rivalry until the Blue Jackets knock them out of the playoffs. I get that. I understand that. But it's building that direction. And it's building that direction rather quickly, quite frankly. Uh, what are the team? Oh, here I should say who wrote this question. William Michael D. What are the team's weaknesses that were exposed in the playoffs and how do they fix them? Free agency? Anyone come to mind? Um. Well, the uh, the center position, I think, was uh, pretty glaring in this playoff series. Now, that being said, you've got Pittsburgh, who has two of the top centermen in the game playing on their team in Crosby and Malkin. So you were never going to win the head-to-head battle when it comes to centermen. But they do need to be stronger in that regard, especially near the top. I thought William Carlson was fantastic. I thought Lucas Sedlak was good when he came back. You know, Dubinsky probably didn't have as good of a playoff as he wanted to. And Alexander Wenberg certainly did not have as good of a playoff as he wanted to. So free agency, I, I don't know about that. I, when you get into free agency, you got to pay a lot of money, and you're already a team that's near the cap, so sometimes you don't have a lot of money. So you got to be careful with that. Aaron Winland says, any interest in doing a weekly or a monthly – or huh, let's try it again. Take two. Any interest in doing a weekly or monthly CBJ or NHL news wrap-up podcast? Don't know if I can go without your show and your thoughts until October. Well, thank you, Aaron. That is very kind of you. I don't know. Um, it, it, that's a question where today I would say, nope, I'm pretty burned out doing this show. I've enjoyed it. I've liked it, but it's a lot of work, and I'd like to take a break from it. I said that earlier, I think. No, I did say it earlier, something to that effect, but – uh, as time goes on, maybe I could be persuaded. So we'll have to wait and see. As I told somebody the, the, uh, this morning, I did two interviews today, one on our network station in Lima and another in, on our network station in Dayton. And I told these guys, I said, i got to get all the talking I can in right now because nobody's going to want to hear what I have to say for four months. But, Aaron, you have made me believe that maybe somebody does want to hear what I have to say. So I will very much consider it. Phantom says, which Cleveland Monsters people have a good shot at making the team next year, and who's on the Blue Jackets that might be leaving? Uh, guys in Cleveland, I don't know. I, have they um, have they brought them all up? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, and if you're saying Sonny Milano, I, I think he's going to have a hard time fitting in here. I really do. I don't see it. I saw him playing a couple of games, obviously, one of those in the playoffs, and he was um, – in the in the short in the small sample size, non-factor. So, I don't know. He's the one guy that jumps out. There are some some of these other guys are now starting to turn pro. Uh, Vitaly Abramov. It's going to be interesting to watch him and see how he plays as a pro. He was fantastic in junior. Um, he looks like he could be one of those little water bug type guys that just uh, is quick and bounces all over the place and you can't stop him. So uh, I don't know. I don't know. Keegan Colasar is a guy I can't wait to see when he comes in and he plays. Uh, Cole Sherwood, can't forget about him. He had a good junior career. And, you know, for me, the thing about Sherwood is not that he's from New Albany and he's a local kid that is playing in the Blue Jackets system. That I almost said I could care less about that. That's not true. I do care about that. But I want him to be here because he's a good hockey player that can make this franchise better, not that he's from up the road. <laughs> you know what I said? I, I'm la I stopped and I laughed because where I come from, growing up in a rural area, that's what we say. It's not because he's from up the road. You know, in the city you say it's not because he's from down the street. So <laughs> I don't care which way you look at it. Up the road, down the street, doesn't matter. You need to be here because you can play. He played in junior, and now for these guys it's going to be making the transition to the pro game. But uh, – um, the Colasar kid from uh, in the Western Hockey League is a guy that I'm looking forward to seeing and see if he can make that transition to the pro game because I've really liked him in camps. But there are a lot of guys that look really good in camps and then they get in games and, and against NHL players and they don't look so good. So um, there's a handful of those guys that are going to have to prove themselves. Sean Moeller says, Number did I waste so much time with the NFL? Sean, I have no idea. I have no idea. In fact, I'm not even sure what that question is, but I don't know why you would spend so much time there, and I really don't know a lot about your that particular question. Here's question two. 
when will opening night be next year? I don't know that either. Uh, the schedule will come out in June, and until it does, I cannot tell you. Trotter says, where did Alexander Wenberg disappear to in that series? Trotter, I think Alexander Wenberg disappeared after he took that hit in the New York Islanders game right near the end of the year. I don't think he was the same guy afterwards. If I find out that he has been playing hurt, it will not surprise me whatsoever. But I think if you trace it back to that hit that he took in Brooklyn and look at his play from then until now, it's completely different. He was uh, not as good of a player. And that's that's where I have it traced to. And again, I don't know if he was playing hurt. I think he was. I don't know for sure. Uh, there will be an injury report probably next Tuesday when Yarmo Kekalainen and John Davidson – Address the, address the media, but um, he didn't just disappear in that series. He's been gone for a couple of weeks, and that hurt. That There's no doubt that hurt. You know, he's he really did a good job filling that role of a number one centerman this year. You can argue whether or not that's going to be his role, if he's better as a number two, but you don't have a number one right now, so he is that guy, and he did a good job throughout the year, but in these last couple of weeks, he was a different player, and I hope it was because he was hurt. Not that I want him to be hurt. But that would explain the drop-off so significantly. Jay Tipping says, thanks for a great season. I enjoy your work. See you in October. Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. Bruce says, with everyone coming in with low expectations, at what point or moment this season did you know that this team is the real deal? Oh, it's a good question. 16-game winning streak, I guess, because they just kept winning and winning and finding a way and – and we're confident about it. They never, they never uh, blinked, really. They just expected to win, and they did win. And then, I, uh, I really, uh, I believed in them because they believed in themselves. The way they ran through that streak. How's that? Uh, Bruce says I also wanted to say thank you for mentioning which radio station to tune into to get your live feed uh, when I'm at the arena during the games. Bruce, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And anything I can do to help. Hopeful Jackets fan says, we need a fifth line postseason celebration. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Put it on the schedule. We'll all be there. Bill Lutz says, Blue Jackets need to spend cap money to go get centers. Must be better down the middle, and proven scores would help. Matt Duchesne was available. And Matt Duchesne will probably be available this summer as well. Um, nobody could make a deal for him at the trade deadline, and I'm sure a lot of teams will be looking at him this summer to see if they can uh, find something that works. Will that be the Blue Jackets? I don't know. Could be. I, I just said the center position. Listen, with Sedlak being there is good. Um, I, I like it, but it, it can be better for sure. I mean, you've got, let's see here. So Wenberg, Dubinsky, Carlson, Sedlak down the middle. That's good, not great. You could always get a guy that could play more minutes and move Dubinsky to the wing if you wanted to and let him just bang and crash and beat the heck out of people. Um, you know, you could do a lot of things. You could do a lot of things. But, again, you want to make a trade, you're going to have to give up something that you like to get something else. So just be aware of that. Just be aware of somebody going the other way. Don't It doesn't come for free. And if you're not going to get a guy like Matt Duchesne for uh, a low-level prospect and two draft picks, you're going to have to give up somebody that can play right now with Colorado. So just keep all of that in mind when you talk about wheeling and dealing, for sure. Uh, CB Jackalope says, do you see any buyouts coming before expansion, specifically Scott Hartnell, if he doesn't waive his no-movement clause? That's an interesting one. If he doesn't waive his no-movement clause, I don't know – what they're going to do. They might not have a choice other than to buy him out. I mean, he, he played last night because Felino couldn't play. Uh, he was going to be scratched. He got scratched the game before. I love Scott Hartnell. I think he's done a lot of good things here this year. I, I love the way he embraced his role this year. He didn't like his role, but he embraced it. He wasn't a problem. He was a good example for the young guys. He was a good leader. Um, I, I liked everything about what Scott Hartnell did this year. And I can see – in his case, he's got to be looking at things and saying, where do I fit in? And if he doesn't feel that he fits in, and if he wants to use that no-movement clause and use it as a, as leverage 
to get a buyout so that he can still get his money or most of his money and then go somewhere else and sign for a year or so. I could see that. I, and I, I would totally understand that, to be completely honest with you, because I don't know where he fits in. With all those young guys here, I don't know where he fits in in the future. And, again, maybe you make some trades and then he does fit in somewhere. But, you know, right now he was an odd man out. And he wants to play, and I understand him wanting to play. And if he can't play here, maybe he tries to work some kind of an agreement where he can find a place to go and play. Remember last year they they uh, had permission to trade him during the summer, and you know he didn't go anywhere. So who knows? It's such a uh, it's such a fickle thing, and you just don't know what other teams want and and what they need and it, what they're willing to give up. To get that, what are you willing to give up? What are they willing to give up? It's all, it's uh, ever changing. It's ever changing. But I don't. Scotty Hartnell is going to be an interesting situation. And again, I like him a lot. I think he's, I think he's good for this team. But he's better if he's playing because you, you get to a point where, you know, you're getting near the end of your career and you're not playing, and that would become frustrating, and. I don't think anybody wants that. I don't think he wants that. I don't think they want that. So that would be, to me, that's probably the situation to watch right now, from now until the expansion draft, getting him to waive the no-movement clause, whether he'll do it or not, and if he doesn't do it, what approach is taken from there. So, well, hey, a lot of interesting times coming up here in the next couple of weeks, a lot of interesting times, and uh, a lot of things going on. But that's where we stand today. Thank you for your questions. Uh, they've been they've been great all year. You know, you know sometimes you sometimes you uh, roll through them, and I, there have been times in the past. And I swear to you, it hasn't happened this year where you get some stuff and you look at it and you go, "What kind of a question is that?" or "What is this?" or "Is anybody thinking before they ask these questions?" You guys have been great all year. Every time I've solicited your thoughts or your opinions or your questions. They've really been well thought out, and I'm, I'm happy about that because here's what I see. It's not, just, it's not just your questions and my ability to give you an answer that makes sense. It's about the fact that you care. And I think a lot of people have come aboard that care now. A lot of new fans were added this year. There's a lot of people, I think, that have started to watch and listen to games that aren't even sure exactly what they're watching and they're listening to. But they'll learn. And if you know somebody like that, if you know the game well and you have a friend that is just kind of getting involved and starting to to like it because of the success this team had this year, you know, be a mentor. Teach them. Teach them about the game. Teach them about um, the culture of the game. Whatever it is, bring them in. Because that's that's the thing that has been the most fun for me this year is watching the new people, getting questions from new people. And some people just say, hey, I just really got into this. And I want to know, what is icing? You know, it's crazy stuff. We we have this discussion. I've had this discussion with Jody Shelley several times throughout the course of the year. You, We can't assume in our jobs that everybody knows what icing is, that everybody knows what offside is, that everybody knows uh, what too many men on the ice, how that's determined. How, we just, you know, it's easy to take for granted because of the strong base of fans that have been here for all these years, and it starts back with the minor league teams that played here throughout the years and then getting into the NHL and playing 16 seasons in the NHL. Sometimes you think everybody that's listening or watching or coming to the events that they know everything, and that's not the case, man. I mean, this team was bringing in new people all the time, and that's why I've said before, if there's something you don't understand, send me the question. I'm, I'm not going to ridicule you. I'm not going to chastise you. I'm going to educate you because we need all of you. We need each and every one of you and then some. This market will be terrific when this team starts going to the playoffs every year and starts challenging for the Stanley Cup every year. Right now, to me, getting into the playoffs it should be a, a no-brainer. That's not good enough anymore. Now that you've been there this year, getting there is not good enough. Now it's about winning, and I don't mean winning one round. Let's not go on a... Uh, progression here all right let's go get knocked out in the first round go to the stanley cup final next year and that's that sounds crazy but why is it crazy it's been done before teams have done it before all you have to do is get hot at the right time 
And the Blue Jackets were cold at the wrong time this year going into the playoffs. Just get get there and be hot at the right time. That's That's all you need to do. Give yourself a chance. But let's start to give ourselves a chance every single year. Let's open this window of opportunity. Let's not let it fall shut on our fingertips. Again, that's going to be the challenge of the management throughout the course of the summer. It's going to be the challenge of the players to have themselves in shape again when next training camp comes. There are a lot of great things that happen. There are a lot of great things that are going to happen. And I'm glad you're there for all of those things that have happened and you're going to be there for the things that are going to happen. But bring more people. Bring them. I always joke about people being bandwagon fans. I could care less. If the bandwagon is not big enough, buy a new bandwagon. Build a new bandwagon. Bring them on. To me, this is the greatest sport. This is family. This is team. The individual efforts are all within the team concept. If I'm not playing good enough, I'm hurting you. If you're not playing good enough, you're hurting me. This isn't baseball where it's a series of one-on-one battles between a pitcher and a batter, a catcher and a base runner. Um, you know, the football is, is similar, but I just think there this this sport is the greatest because of the unity you have to have as a team, the chemistry, the unity, the family atmosphere around every team in the NHL, every team. Everybody's part of the same family. You're part of the big NHL family, and then you get broken up into your individual families, your 30, soon-to-be 31 individual families. But to be honest with you, it's even like going into the Penguins dressing room. When I sit down and talk with Brian Rust or Jake Gensel or um, Carter Rowney, all those young guys, uh, you hate them when they play against you because they're doing good things and they're helping to beat your team. But they're good people. There are so many good people in this sport, and that's not just on the ice, and it's not just in the coaches' offices, and it's not just in the front offices. It's in the stands, too. I mean, this is – when you guys talk about being the fifth line, you are. You're a part of it. And we want you to be a big part of it. And that's what you were this year. And it's time to build, and it's time to move forward in a big way, move forward. So – That's where we are as of today. It's time to take a breath, sit back, lick your wounds, and then in the next couple of days, think about the accomplishments that were made here. Think about the future and how bright it is. And from the team standpoint, they've got to think about that and then fortify that future. You get to sit back and see what they do to fortify it. You get to have your opinions. You get to uh, be around the players. You get to get bought in to this whole thing, and that's the best part of it. So that is going to do it for this last CBJ and 30 of the season. Time to say goodbye. You know, I've always wanted to use this song. I don't even understand the words except for the couple in English. I don't even know what the heck they're saying here. But I love this song. I've been looking for an excuse to use this song. So here it is. This was far more than 30 minutes today. We've gone twice as long, but when will I talk to you again? Well, I can tell you. Next Wednesday, Jody Shelley and I have one more edition of the Inside Edge that we will bring you on the flagship station of the Blue Jackets Radio Network, 97.1 The Fan in Columbus. You'll also be able to get it through the NHL app and on the uh, uh, bluejackets.com. You can get it there. But Jody and I will do a show on Wednesday, so it won't be that long. I've got to get ready to watch some uh, high school baseball games this weekend. I've got to be a fan, sit in the stands, listen to everybody talk about the game like they know exactly what's going on, and really I'm the only one that does. So it'll drive me crazy, but it'll be uh, different and fun, as a matter of fact. But uh, this has been fun. This season has been fun. This show has been fun. Meeting many of you, dealing with you, has been terrific. And we're going to do it again. We're going to do it again. It won't be soon enough for any of our liking, but we're going to do it again. So enjoy your weekend. Jody and I will talk to you next Wednesday night on the Inside Edge. 
I'm Bob McElligot saying thanks for being there, not just today, but for being there always and listening to CBJ in 30.